As we begin the chapter on deviance, I want to introduce a very important new concept, and that is unit of analysis. A unit of analysis is fairly simple. It is basically what the social scientist is studying. And so when we study deviance, typically people think of the unit of analysis being the individual. An individual commits an act of deviance. But as we know from our life experience, other things can commit acts of deviance. And so we can talk about governments and organizations and even businesses committing acts of deviance. One example is the fire that just occurred where there were many people killed in Bangladesh. In fact, right now, the owners of the company have been arrested for the charge of murder. That is, those individuals were deviant, but the whole company was deviant because it was violating basic safety laws. When talking about deviance, we need to expand our view and not just to talk about individual deviance, but organizational deviance as well. Right now, the nation of Myanmar is being tried in the international court on charges of genocide that were brought by the Gambia in Africa. As a nation, the Gambia raised the issue of genocidal actions in Myanmar. And so Myanmar was forced to go to the international court in The Hague to defend themselves against the charge of genocide. That is, the deviant in this case that was being charged was not an individual, but rather an entire government and military. And so you see that the unit of analysis is not the individual in this case, it is the organization, in this case, again, the government of Myanmar and the military of Mil Myanmar. Talking about deviance can raise all kinds of questions about who has power and how that power gets used to keep control of various groups and individuals. And so deviance is perhaps one of the most important topics beyond the self and society that we have focused on on the earlier parts of this class. Deviance is a cultural universal. You can find deviance in all cultures around the world both individual deviants and organizational and governmental deviants. The sociologist Emil Durkheim has a lot to say about how deviants can function positively for a society. One example of how deviants can function positively is looking at the concept of positive deviants. And so, for an example, in a community, if there is one family that is surviving much better than all of the other families, the question is, what are they doing differently to make them survive in a better fashion than the other families? They are deviant, that is, they deviate from the normal, but what is it about them that makes them positive deviants, surviving better than the other families? By looking at these positive deviants, we can learn about how to get along in society better with the same resources. Another example of a positive deviant is an exceptional athlete, somebody who is far better than everyone else. They are deviating from the norm, that is, they are doing something exceptional, but they are a positive deviant. And so these last two examples are meant to describe how deviance is not just a negative thing, but can be a positive thing as well. Another positive function of deviance is that it can point out some areas where a culture needs to improve. And so, for example, if there, like there was in the United States, various um, protests about uh, Black Lives Matter and those kinds of situations, what that 
was cumulatively all of those protests taken together was an indication that there was some fundamental issue that needed to be addressed. These individual protests in various cities around the United States functioned to highlight to uh, everyone that there needed to be something done about racial inequality. The same thing is happening right now in Myanmar where each of these individual acts of protest in uh, previous times might have been seen as deviant. Collectively, all of these acts of deviance, all of these protests are indicating that there needs to be something done in Myanmar to address the question of democracy for all. In this video, I want to talk about a topic that we addressed in class this past week. That is the topic of othering and colonial powers. Othering is the core process that generates the privileging forces of the hydra. I'll be explaining the hydra a bit later. But othering works basically this way. A doesn't equal B. The in-group doesn't equal the out-group or my family doesn't equal your family or my sports team doesn't equal your sports team. There's always a uh, an infinite number of A's and B's, one group and another group. And so normal or non-toxic othering is when group A is different from group B and it ends there. That is called differentiation. Toxic othering comes when one group, we'll call it A, feels it as if it is better than B. Group A is superior to group B. This is stratification. This is putting things in layers, one on top of the other. This is toxic othering. In the case of colonization, countries, for example, like Great Britain, went around the world and colonized various parts of the world. They, of course, colonized North America. They colonized Southeast Asia. They colonized Australia. They colonized many parts of the world. In fact, at one point, there was a phrase that said, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It was a global empire built on colonization. This colonization was based on the assumption that one group was superior to another group. The British were imposing their will onto people around the world and having them do what the British wanted them to do for political and economic gain. In our equation, A doesn't equal B, we can put the British Empire was greater than all of the othered uh, cultures and nations around the world. This is a perfect example of toxic othering, this case being colonial impact around the world. Colonial impact around the world continues and the legacies of colonization exist everywhere around the world, including Myanmar and Bangladesh. In this video, I want to talk about norms and tolerance limits for norms. Norms are rules for behavior that most of us follow most of the time. And when I say us, I mean both us as individuals, but also us as governments and organizations and even businesses. A tolerance limit is how much someone can get away with before people react to the violation of the norm. So for example, if I cut in line um, people may not notice or may not care enough to respond. But if I cut into line over and over again, or I cut into the very beginning of the line, then I've crossed a boundary. I've crossed the tolerance limit for that norm. And people feel compelled to respond. In the same way, 
governments and businesses have the same kind of tolerance limits. And so a business can get away with uh, polluting the water around its company uh, to a certain extent. But after a while, people or governmental agencies are going to notice and they're going to want to punish that business. And so there's a tolerance limit where the business can get away with a little bit of deviance, but there's a line after being crossed, people organiza or organizations have to respond. That is the tolerance limit, the limit to which the violation of the norm can be tolerated. Both people and organizations and officials are able to act as agents of social control. That is, they can respond to violations of norms and police the tolerance limits for norms. We use the terms formal agent of social control and informal agent of social control. So for example, if I see somebody cutting in line and I say, hey, you can't do that, then I'm acting unofficially and as an informal agent of social control. I'm calling someone out for having violated a norm. On the other hand, if I am a, a government watchdog agency, and a business does something wrong, then I am a formal agent of social control. I am empowered by laws to uh, punish or fine or arrest the company and the company officials for violating the norm. We are all very much impacted by formal and informal agents of social control, and we even are agents of social control ourselves. One of your classmates very recently asked a wonderful and very important question on our WhatsApp group. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about this question. The question had to do with othering and toxic othering. The question essentially was, how do we change from toxic othering to non-toxic othering? There couldn't be a better question. There couldn't be a more important question to focus on as we address the issue of our local problems and our international problems. The question is essentially about social change and how we can deconstruct some parts of our society which weave in toxic othering and address those norms and policies and laws and begin to change them in a positive direction. An American cleric used the phrase bending the moral arc of the universe and he made the point that the direction of the moral arc is toward justice and our job, and this is my words, our job is to work in such a way as we move the direction of the moral arc toward justice. Um, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it does, and I believe in this, it does bend toward justice. And what this means, what this justice means, is a world where toxic othering has been eradicated. Toxic othering of other uh, genders, of other races, of other ethnicities, of other nations, uh, of other peoples in general. Toxic othering is eradicated from the earth. And so our job as social thinkers, our job as people who are leaders in our community is to work in such a way as that we minimize toxic othering and maximize pathways that uh, are non-othering, non-toxic othering. In short, getting rid of toxic othering is a huge job that we all need to participate in, both on the individual level and on the organizational level. We need to encourage ourselves and everyone around us and all of the organizations to which we belong. We need to have them move toward a non-toxic othering kind of set of norms and policies and laws.
Let's begin this dirt journey together.